This operation is taking place now as you see it. We are in the surgery amphitheater at Stanford University Hospital in San Francisco. An eight-year-old boy is on the operating table. His name is Tommy. He was born with a defective heart. Without surgery, Tommy's chances of living to maturity are very slim. With surgery, his hope for life improves tremendously. Because Tommy has so much to gain, his parents and his doctors have decided on this operation. It is only fair that you know, as they do, that there is a risk. Operating within the human heart is complicated, difficult, and dangerous. Until very recently, it was thought to be impossible. KPIX, in cooperation with the San Francisco Medical Society, has arranged for this first live telecast of open heart surgery with the heart-lung machine, so you may better understand modern medicine and surgery. This on-the-spot report is presented by Seba Pharmaceutical Products Incorporated. For three quarters of a century, the source of new and improved plastics, dyes, chemical specialties, and pharmaceuticals. SEBA stands for originality and quality the world over. SEBA, where research is the tradition. I'm John Weston, your surgery commentator. With me in the operating theater is Dr. Dennis Melrose, a heart surgeon from London, England. Dr. Melrose is the inventor of a heart-lung machine and will assist us by providing a description of the operation as it proceeds. Now, right now, while the operating team is preparing Tommy for surgery, we're going to return you to our KPIX studios. In a few minutes, we will return to the operation to see its interesting and dramatic procedures. Thank you, John. In order to understand and appreciate the surgical procedures that you are about to see, it's necessary to have certain basic information about the heart and its functions in the human body. So we brought together five experts to answer some very important questions for us. I'd like to begin with Dr. Saul Joel Robinson, the Chief of Pediatrics at Mount Zion Hospital and Associate Clinical Professor of Pediatrics at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Robinson, suppose we begin by your telling us something about the heart. The heart is an amazing organ. When you imagine that in the normal heart beats 70 times a minute or 4,200 times an hour, or a hundred thousand times a day, or even 37 million times a year, you can imagine what an amazing organ it is. But in order to explain to you the heart, perhaps I'd like to use this diagram over here. This represents a heart cut in half in diagrammatic form. The blood, which starts out from the veins of the extremities, comes in here through these two large vessels into a large chamber called an atrium. From here through a valve and out through another valve to the lungs where the blood is purified by the addition of oxygen and the giving off of carbon dioxide. It then returns to the heart and this is a simplified form of the same heart with the vessels taken away. Then returns to the heart on this side and goes into a similar type of chamber here through this valve and then out through a large vessel to be distributed throughout the body. Now, Dr. Robinson, what has happened in Tommy's heart to interfere with this normal action? In order to keep the purified and the non-purified blood in the heart separate, there are two walls. One is a wall between the two upper chambers. Another is the wall between the two lower chambers, or the ventricles. In Tommy's case, and this is a, an excellent diagram of it, there is a hole in the wall between the two upper chambers. And how does this affect the patient, doctor? The blood from the lungs, instead of going from this upper chamber into this lower chamber and out into the body, a large portion of it, as much as 14 or 15 quarts per minute, escapes over to this side and goes back into the lungs, sort of wasted, as it were, in such a way that the body and the heart has to work much harder in order to get a normal amount of blood out to the body. And how long can a child live with this condition? In general, a child's lifespan is very much shortened. Although in the early years, there aren't too many symptoms, especially, uh, unless one considers a, a slight amount of fatigability, the inability to do as well as other children, some stunting in growth. There are very few symptoms. But as he grows older, his capacity to do things becomes much less. Until when he reaches 18 or 19 years of age, 
his heart really begins to fail. And how do his chances of life without surgery? We know that in most instances, the lifespan of a child with a defect such as this, the whole what a defect like this can mean to a young boy, we wanted to find out all we could. So we visited Tommy and his family just seven days ago. Tommy met us and took us up these stairs, which incidentally he climbs somewhat more slowly than his younger brother Don. And then at the top of the stairs, he introduced us to his mother and father. When did you first suspect that there was uh, something wrong with you? <coughs> Well, actually, I didn't uh, suspect it. Anything mattered with him. It just happened to show up in his regular six-month checkup, which is very important. I think that most children, or all children, rather, have regular checkups because that's how I found it out. The doctors found that his heart wasn't quite right, and he was about two and a half years old. And what were you told about his condition at that time? Well, I was told that there was a heart murmur that he was born with and that possibly he would outgrow it. And if not, later on, it could be corrected with surgery. And have the doctors followed his progress pretty closely since that time? Yes, he's had uh, at least one checkup okay. a year since that time with four and four and everything that he goes through in those regular years of checkup feel about this disability now? Does he feel that it limits his activity? No, I uh, don't think he feels anything, really. He's, uh, it doesn't bother him a bit, and uh, we actually have to keep our eye on him to keep him from becoming overtired because it doesn't bother him. What are some of the things that you like to limit him from doing? Well, uh, the other day we found him walking down the street with a boy almost his own size on his back which is quite, quite a strain. And how does he feel about the operation itself? What does he know about it? Well, actually, he feels no fear at all whatsoever. He's very nonchalant about it, and uh, maybe it's the fact that I've told him he's going to go into surgery. I've tried to explain in words that he could understand what was going to happen to him, and uh, I believe that maybe that is why he's not afraid, because it's the fear of the unknown that makes a child afraid. Sir, I understand that you received special leave from the Coast Guard in order to come home uh, for the operation, is that right? Yes, I was on the Coast Guard depot on Guam, and the Red Cross first contacted my commanding officer requesting authorization for the operation. And it was through the Red Cross and the doctors and the officers at the depot that resulted in my getting this emergency leave to be here for this. When were you first told that an operation would be necessary to correct Tommy's condition? Well, that was two months or two and a half months ago. I had had all of his medical records transferred to Oak Knoll Hospital, and I took him out for his regular yearly checkup, and uh, they immediately thought that it was a heart murmur that would require surgery. And what were some of the things that prompted your decision to go ahead with the operation at this time? Well, it was a... Uh the fact that there was some good that could be done by surgery to correct this. So actually there was no question about it, but that it should be done. And they told me at the time, the, heart, the doctor I took him to out there, that by the time he was a very young man, he would be almost an invalid or semi-invalid. And actually, no matter how great the risk, there was no other choice to make. That if he could live a normal life with surgery, that, by all means, was what I would choose to do, no matter what the risk was. Before surgery could proceed, a lot of diagnosis was necessary. Suppose we ask Dr. Ellen Simpson about this. Dr. Simpson is assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of California School of Medicine. Dr. Simpson? There are a number of things which may lead to a child being found out to have an abnormal heart condition. A child may be perfectly normal looking and active and healthy looking and be found on a normal physical examination to have a heart murmur or abnormal noise in the heart. In some cases, the child may be growing poorly. He may be small or be uh, lacking in normal energy, and this may lead to an examination by his doctor. 
The doctor takes a careful history which uh, discusses how the child is growing, how active he is, whether he stands infections as well as his brothers and sisters, and then a physical examination in which the doctor attempts to determine whether or not the heart sounds normal, whether it seems to be enlarged or is working too hard, or whether any other evidences of heart abnormality. When any of these things are suspected, further examinations are done, including complete blood counts, urinalysis, electrocardiogram, which determines, again, whether there is excessive strain on the heart, and uh, x-rays of the chest. I mentioned x-rays. Now, do x-rays show this hole in the heart? X-rays won't show a hole as such in the heart. However, in the presence of abnormality, they will show whether the heart is abnormally large or of unusual contour. But for a further explanation for this, I think we should turn to a specialist in the field, Dr. Evelyn Cyrus, who is a radiologist at San Francisco Children's Hospital. A careful X-ray examination of the heart, Bob, is very important when a child is suspected of having a heart defect. We don't see inside the heart under ordinary circumstances, but merely an outline of the heart. Now, here is a chest film of a child who is Tommy's size and age. This is the heart here, almost in the middle of the chest, a little more to the left. These are the blood vessels of the lungs. These are the lungs here. And if I draw a line like so, this is the right side of the heart, and this is the left side of the heart, and here is the main artery going into the lungs from the right side. Now, what we look for are changes in the heart size, in the heart shape, and in the appearance of the lungs. Now, here is a Tommy-type heart defect. As you can see, the heart is much larger. Let's draw our same line here. As you can see, the right side of the heart is much larger. The main vessel going to the lungs, the pulmonary artery, is much larger, and all of the vessels in the lung field are much larger and heavier. This is our clue as to what is going on inside. Dr. Cyrus, after you've completed your study of the x-rays, what then is the next step? Well, first we present these findings, of course, to the child's physician, and then we take these findings and all the other findings that we may have about the child and present those to a board of specialists known as a cardiac review board or a cardiac catheterization board. Cardiac catheterization, that sounds very formidable. Suppose we ask Dr. Alan Simpson to explain just what that means for us. Cardiac catheterization is one of the specialized tests which are sometimes necessary in children with abnormal hearts to determine the exact nature of the defect and just how much strain it is imposing on the heart. We can explain it by referring to this simplified diagram. The heart is shown much larger in the chest than actually just for sake of, of clarity. In a cardiac catheterization, a local anesthetic is, is put in the arm and a small incision made. This tube represents one of the normal veins of the body. The cardiac catheter, which is a little tube, is then pushed into the vein and advanced, as you can see here, up the body. It crosses the, the vein of the upper chest and actually enters the heart. The tip is now in the upper chamber or right atrium, as previously dis described. As we push it, it advances into the right ventricle and thence, with further manipulation, into the pulmonary artery or the vessel of the lung. We filmed a cardiac catheterization recently at Mount Zion Hospital. And as we uh, look at this film, would you explain it for us, Dr. Simpson? This is a film of a little girl undergoing this type of study. This little girl is being prepared. She has been given a mild sedative, which, as you can see, is wide awake. A little local anesthetic is put into her arm. She is now being prepared by the uh, nurse or anesthetist, and the, the team which participates in this test is now preparing the child. The arm is carefully cleansed and a small incision made in it. The child is, is usually awake and cooperative during this time and is not particularly upset by the procedure.